Hey, this is Mark, and I'm back with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And for sure, this week would would be that case. This guy's name is Todd Orr, and he was not once but twice attacked by a grizzly bear in Montana. I actually found this guy on YouTube. I wasn't actually out there looking for somebody who got attacked by a grizzly bear, but it just happened to come into my orbit And I saw it and I go, holy smokes, what is this? And then I turned uh, it on. I watched this video. So this is after he'd hiked out three miles, come back to the car. And now he's doing this selfie video of, hey, my name is Todd. I just got attacked by a bear, showing all the wounds. I mean, it's just, you know, a mess. So very fascinating tale. And thankfully, he's with us today, overcoming his adversity, certainly finding his way. And uh, it's just a great pot. So uh, thankful for that. And always remember, if you can find out what's going on with me at www.markpattisonnfl.com, I have an e-learning course that's coming, which is uh, very cool. And I'm going down to Vincent in January, so uh, you'll be able to follow my my journey when that all happens. And uh, as always, this pod is brought to you by, by VioletterBlueSkinCare.com. Cynthia Besteman, rock star. Uh, and that's it. So on that note, Let's go talk to Todd. Here we go. Hey, it's Mark, and I'm back with another incredible tale of survival on finding your summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And this week we have Todd Orr, who was attacked by a grizzly bear, not once but twice. Can you believe that? Uh, Just incredible. So first of all, Todd, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Mark. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so, okay, so I'm beaming from Sun Valley. You are in Bozeman, Montana. I think we're only about four hours apart. I was up there not too long ago, and I've got a, a, uh, a, some close ties. I, I actually built a, a ranch outside of uh, Belgrade um, many years ago. I sold it a few years ago, but uh, just know that, that those parts very well, and I can't wait to get into the story. But, but let's talk about when you grew up in Ennis. Um, you know, it sounds like you were a person who, who grew up, you had a great role mo- model in your dad, and he did, really yes. introduced you to the outdoors. Yes, uh, my whole family was into the outdoors and the camping, the hunting, the fishing, the hiking. And I moved there when I was in second grade, so about seven years old. And just every weekend, every evening, we're out in the woods or out in the hills trying to do something to enjoy the outdoors. It's a great place to grow up and just love southwest Montana. Yeah, I know. So I've been down there uh, many times. And I've fished down there in those those different uh, rivers. I think you, uh, the Madison is near you and a few other ones down there. It's just fantastic fishing. Um, was your love first of, of being in the outdoors from float tubing or was it more really being in the mountains to hike or to hunt? Well, it's a little bit of everything, but it started, I think, the first day we got to Montana. We were waiting for the moving van, and Dad said, hey, let's go down to the Madison River, and he put a fly rod in my hand and started teaching me to fly fish. So I got addicted to the fly fishing right off the bat, and we lived at the fish hatchery over there in Ennis, and it's right at the base of the Gravelly Mountains. So I spent most of my time on a dirt bike or a bicycle heading up to the mountain, hiking, camping, following my dad during hunting season and until I was able to hunt myself and then started bow hunting at age 14 and just kind of kept continuing and still going today. Well, for anybody who's not been to Ennis, it's a very interesting town because you really get the feel of, you know, back in like the late 1800s almost and, and there's a fly shop at about every two doors down and you know, you go up there and everything is like a wood um, surface front, and it's it's very cool. You know, it's very kind of must uh, rustic um, in some ways, but you know, it's a big enough town that it de- definitely things are going on. Yeah, it's a, it's a busy place now. And you know, forty years ago when I first moved there, forty five years ago, it was a lot smaller. It was just kind of a cowboy ranching town. And now it's expanded. I mean, we've got a lot of tourists that come through there on their way to Yellowstone Park, but you've still got, you know, a great hunting area. you got the flat, the Blue Ribbon trout streams right there, the Madison River, a lot of mountain lakes, a lot of peaks to climb, a lot of outdoor recreation in general, whether it's skiing or hiking or shooting or taking your ATV up to the top of the mountain. It's There's everything to offer in the, in the Madison Valley. Great place to grow up. 
Yeah. So later in life, you then uh, you kind of grew up to be, if that's the right word, uh, working for the Gallatin National Forest uh, Department. And, uh, yes. you know, I, I guess where I'm trying to get to with all this is that you're not a guy, a newbie like from New York City that never was exposed to the outdoors. You're somebody that spent a lot of time uh, on the riverbanks going up mountains and your career actually led you to um, being in the in the in the woods, climbing, hiking, yes. doing all those things, quite a bit. Yes, exactly. I just I, I hate being in the office or being inside. I'm one of those people that wants to be outside as much as possible, and I've just spent my life out there, whether it is for work or for play. And I've camped in the mountains. I've done a little bit of every kind of recreation out there, and then so I, it just made sense to get a job that was in the outdoors as well. So I got started in 1990 with the Gallatin National Forest, and I worked in timber. and I have a degree in fish and wildlife management, so I worked in fisheries and wildlife for a few years, and then the last 11 or 12 years now, I've been working in engineering as a trail systems engineer. So I do all the design, the survey, staking, flagging, and contracting for any new trails we build or any trail repair or reroutes. So I'm in the woods every day for work by myself, usually in bear country. And, you know, weekends I'm out there usually fishing or camping or hiking in bear country as well. Yeah, so let's start to get into that. So I spent many, 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 many years in Montana and... Uh, most of the bears that were up in our neck of the woods, and this again, this would have been uh, north of Belgrade, so in that Bozeman, Belgrade, that type mm -hmm. of area. But most of the bears up there are black bears. And so there wasn't, you know, for all the, the guys who've been there forever, you know, there really wasn't any kind of report, any kind of sightings of any kind of grizzly bears that were coming through. And, and from what I understand, they're mostly down in the Yellowstone, greater Yellowstone area. And then um, up in uh, Glacier, which is up on top of north of uh, Missoula. I, I'm just trying to understand why bears did not, you know, find places kind of in between those two regions of the state. Well, I think things have changed the last 20 years for sure. Because even near closer to Yellowstone, you didn't see very many grizzly bears. It was always black bears. But in the last 10 or 15 years, there seems to be a huge increase in grizzly bears. And we now have grizzly bears right here outside of town, Bozeman. Uh, but even seeing grizzly bears in uh, the Bridger and the Crazy Mountains, which is really rare. And so their territory is expanding, and I think their numbers have expanded you know, dramatically in the last 10 years. So what I was always taught is if it's a black bear, you fight. If it's a brown bear or grizzly, you lay down and you play dead. What, what's your opinion? Well, yeah, if a grizzly bear, you have no chance at fighting off a grizzly bear. If it wants to you know, kill you or eat you, it's going to. So there's usually another reason why you're being attacked. It's not just because it wants to eat you, eat you. Usually it's because you're too close. You're in its, you know, it's in its space. Maybe you came up to it. on a, It was feeding on a carcass. Or possibly running into a sow and cubs, as I was, and they she just wasn't comfortable, and I was a threat to her to her cubs. But nothing you can do against a grizzly bear or black bear. I think it kind of depends on the situation. If it's a similar situation where you run into a sow with cubs, she probably is just defending her young as well, and she'd probably bite you a couple times and take off with the cubs. But they say to fight back against a, a, a black bear, and usually, you know, especially if it looks like it's trying to eat you or it's coming to your tent or something like that, then you have no choice but to try to fight back and do something. I, I, so I want to set this up for the audience. So I, I don't even know how I, I fell upon this. So uh, this is probably about a year ago. And I do have a fascination with grizzly bears, number one. Um, but uh, beyond – and I wasn't necessarily like typing this in in the search bar of YouTube. But somehow or another, it just came into my orbit on my screen and it, sh and it says something like, you know, m man attacked by grizzly bears. So I turn this thing on and it's just you like shortly after this whole thing happened and you're, you're filming yourself. And just essentially right. like, hey, I just got attacked by a bear. And right. You got blood coming off your head <laughs> and in your ears and your arms. And it's pretty grotesque. And, you know, I was looking at it again today before we we're going to do this pod. And it's like 1.5 million people have seen this vid. And uh, I'm just like, holy smoke. So let's go back to that day on October 1st, 2016 and kind of set up what happened to lead to all these events. Well, it was, yeah, October 1st, 2016. So it's been two years now. 
and it was a Saturday morning, about two weeks before the general hunting season, and I wanted to get up in the mountains and just look around for some elk and find out you know, where the elk were. And so I got to the trailhead about an hour before daylight, got my gear on my backpack, my bear spray pistol, headed up the trail in the dark with a flashlight, and just yelling out, hey bear, every 30 seconds or so, because I didn't want to spook a bear on the trail. And I get about an hour up the trail right at daylight, and I step out into this opening, and on the other side of this meadow is a sow and two cub grizz, and they step out, we see each other about the same time. And she immediately just turns and runs up the trail and over the ridge, disappears. And I'm thinking, this is a, this is a great bear. She doesn't like people. She's out of here. I, I won't have to worry about her. So I'm just going to give her a minute, and then I'll head the opposite direction, and unlikely I would ever run into her again. And so I waited about 30 seconds or so and didn't see her. So I decided to head up the trail the opposite direction, took a few steps, and heard something out of the in the, out of behind me, kind of over my left shoulder, and I turned, and she had dropped her cubs and had circled around the ridge and came straight over the ridge in a full charge at me, and she was probably 35 or 40 yards, and a uh, grizzly bear can run 35 or 40 miles an hour, so a couple seconds she could be on me, and I just instinctively pulled the bear spray that I had hanging in a chest holster on my chest and just pulled that out, pulled the safety out, kind of expecting a bluff charge or something, but just in case, I've got it ready. And I look back up and she's at like 30 feet, still coming wide open and just her ears laid back, low to the ground. There was no hesitation, no bluff charge. It was full on tack. And I just started stepping backwards and spraying her right in the face. And just her momentum just instantly carried her right through that, that bear spray. And here I was, and she just immediately hit me and was on my right, knocked me down, was on my right side and bit me five or six times on my right arm and shoulder. And then she started coughing from the bear spray and she just took off. And just that quick, it was over. I'm thinking, oh wow, I just got attacked by a grizzly bear and I survived, I've got some wounds. I'm gonna have to head down to the hospital now and get some stitches. Thought that was the end of it. So so hold on, okay. So I know we're, we're gonna get into, it, 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 actually there was a double attack, but we'll get into phase two here in a second. So. So uh, I have, I still own bear spray. So I understand mm -hmm. what that's all about. And you have to pull the pin. You kind of cock this thing back. And then, and then the interesting thing about bear spray is that you have to wait until the bear or whatever animal is coming at you to get within about 10 feet before you unleash this spray. Because it, it, it sprays wide and high, not necessarily deep, right? You know, it puts out a big blast in a cloud, and it has pretty good force, and it'll spray about 30 feet out with a pretty good cloud. So you wouldn't want to shoot any farther than about 30 feet, or it's you know starting to settle at that point. So 20 to 30 feet would be a good a good distance. You know, if you're waiting at 10 feet, uh, then you're almost too late. It's you know by the time you're starting to spray, it's on you as well. Okay. Now, did you also did you also mention that you had a gun? Um, I, I did. Yes, I had a 10 mm in a shoulder holster as well and but it was it was there for more hunting i had a wolf tag and i thought well if i run into a wolf wolf season was open and it's got a scope on it and it's it's more of a hunting pistol and not really a quick draw self-defense pistol and but i instinctively just pulled the bear spray expecting just a bluff charge or she was going to stop anyway and then by then it was too late to go to plan b and and pull the pistol she was already on top of me Right. So, so going back to your experience working in for the, uh, the Gallatin National Forest for 20 mm -hmm. years, had you ever had bear encounters before where maybe something came up or you weren't sure or at least you, know, the, you were kind of looking at them, they were looking at you, but then everything just dissipated or what was your experience? Uh, yes. Yeah, so over the years, I probably see an average of 10 or 12 bears every summer being out in the woods by myself and off the trail in the backcountry. There's usually two or three grizz, and the right, most of them are black bear. And in most situations, you see them, and they walk on by or they wander off. I've had a couple you know, instances over the years where I had a bluff charge, and bear kind of come into you at like 50 feet. But they always stopped, and then they stand up and kind of check you out, trying to see what you were for sure or try to get your scent. And then they turn and leave. So I've never you know, had an issue where they're you know, really right there in your face attacking you. Okay, so... So it sounds like I'm putting words in your mouth a little bit here, but 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 because you had so much experience in the woods by yourself, seeing various critters that are out there, in particular bears, both grizz and black, 
uh, it wasn't something that necessarily your heart was like jumping out of your head and, and you're, 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 you're in this panic. You'd been through this a couple times before and you just, you know, you looked at it and it just was what it was and, and you were doing what you had to do by pulling out this bear spray. And, but you probably never thought this thing would actually follow through on the attack. No, I never expected that. And, you know, like I said, 99% of the time they go the other direction. They don't want anything to do with people. And well, I'm at the Forest Service. I'm not law enforcement, so I can't carry a handgun. I have to, my bear spray is my only protection. So I've practiced with bear spray over and over, drawing it and pulling the safety while I'm out in the woods, just in case, just that muscle memory. The more you practice something, the better, you know, the quicker it's going to come to you automatically. And so when that bear all of a sudden charged and there she was, I just instinctively pulled the bear spray and didn't even really even think about it. More like, okay, just in case, you know, it's, but it's rare. Likely she's not going to, I'm not going to attack. And so I just kind of instinctively pulled the bear spray and I was ready, but then it was too late and hey, this one was for real. Well, I'm sure this is, <laughs> I'm kind of giggling as I say this. I once had to return uh, punts against the Chicago Bears and, Having 11 bears come down on me, I don't think is quite the same thing as a grizzly bear charging you at the same time. Okay, so we are no. – okay, so you survived this first for – this first and to reset this thing, the, the bear got – it just kept coming. It kind of bowled you over. You had some puncture wounds on your shoulder. You get up, but more or less you're not, you know, mauled by any chance. You just had, you know, essentially run over. And you're right. feeling your pains, so you're bleeding a little bit, Ben. your plan is to go down the mountain. That is correct. Yeah, I've got about five or six bite marks in my right arm. And nothing's broke, just dispuncture wounds in my shoulder. And I'm bleeding pretty good, but it's just, you know, bite marks. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to head down to the hospital. I got an hour hike out of here and go get some stitches. So I picked up my stuff and headed down the trail. And it was five or six minutes down the trail, a few hundred yards, and the Trail goes right crosses the creek there, so I'm right near the creek, and it's pretty noisy because of the stream. And as I all of a sudden I heard something behind me, and I turned, and she had come off the ridge again behind me, and was about ten feet this time, charging wide open again. And I just basically caught the glimpse of her out of the corner of my eye, and then she was on top of me. I didn't have time to bear spray her to you know, shoot her or anything. It was just boom, I'm knocked down on my face. Now she's on top of me. She's really angry. She First bite was in my left forearm, and I've got them on my, my face with my knees down, um, protecting the back of my head with my arms. And the first bite is in my left forearm, and I heard the crunch of the bone and felt the tendons getting ripped, and that pain and sound of that bone snapping just kind of made me wince, and I just made this sound, like, ah, and kind of pulled my arm away just instinctively, and that just turned her into a, like a frenzy of attacking. And she would pick me up, shake me, slam me down, she bit me probably 20, 25 times in my right arm, my right shoulder. She at one point bit me in the side, and that kind of turned my body, and I was looking at her face like right there, just a foot from mine. And I just kept using every bit of strength and core strength and power and, and that will to survive to pull everything back in tight and keep my face down and keep down on the ground in a ball so she couldn't just get to my face or my vitals and tear me apart. So essentially, if you would have... Uh, started hitting this bear back, it would have just enraged the bear even more, correct? I, I think it would have, yeah. At this point, I knew that, you know, she's going to go check on her cubs. She didn't have her cubs with her, so I kept telling myself, you know, she's going to check on her cubs as long as you're not a threat. And, I just, and I'm like, I have to play dead. Don't move. Don't breathe. Play dead. She's going she's gonna to leave. So I just kept telling myself that, holding that position, and trying not to get flipped over or turned over. Had I tried to swing at her or tried to get to my gun right then and turn, I think she could have got right at my face or my throat or my vitals, and that could have been the end of it right there. So I just kept – my goal was to stay face down and not let her tear my face apart or get to my vitals. And I just wrote it out, and at one point, one of her claws caught the side of my scalp, and it ripped about a five inch gash just above my ear. And so my eyes filled with blood and I just, she's got her claws stuck in my lower back and got me pinned to the ground and just, it was like a rag doll for a while there. And I'm just, every bite, I just kind of blocked out the pain. It's amazing what your body can do in that survival situation. I remember the pain of the first bite when she broke my arm, but then I, I can't associate any pain with all the rest of the bites, but all my other you know senses were heightened. I can, 
remember how bad she smelled and I can remember hearing the crunch of the muscle when her teeth would like bury into my arm or my shoulder and just a crazy experience that I just kept telling myself over and over just just don't move she's gonna leave and that was my only thing was like I knew that if I tried to fight back I'd be dead how long did this go for do you think Uh, it was just a minute or two of that and then she just stopped and that was probably the eeriest part of the whole thing is with her standing on my back and her claws are like stuck into my lower back right below my backpack and I'm just pinned and smashed into the dirt and she's just sniffing the back of my neck and I can feel and hear that her breath right there just inches from my spine and it's just like one bite through my hands into my spine it would be over and she would sniff and then she'd bite me on the shoulder and then she'd sniff and bite me on the arm and just kind of nipping at the end just testing to see if I was still a threat or if I was incapacitated or dead. And after about 30 seconds of that, she just stood there for a minute. I'm guessing she's probably looking around to see if there's any other threat or to see where her cubs were. And then she just stepped off and disappeared. And I'm holding that position still because I don't know if she's 10 feet away or if she, if she actually left the area. And so I waited about 30 seconds and then I got to thinking that if she goes and checks on her cubs and then comes back and I'm still here, she's going to attack me a third time. So I really slowly reached down trying to get to my pistol in the shoulder holster and the pistol had been ripped off of me during the attack. So I was completely helpless. So I slowly wiped some blood from each eye, kind of looked each direction and I saw my pistol laying over there in the dirt about 10 feet away. So I just dove for the pistol, pulled it out of the holster and looking around ready and she was completely gone. So I, I knew immediately I have to get out of here. I need to just get as far as I can away from her as soon as possible. So I picked up my stuff and just headed down the trail trying to get distance between her and I. Yep, yep. And, and, and for people who don't or haven't experienced bears like this, I mean, you're talking about the claws on these paws are literally like daggers or like, you know, chef knives that you'd buy down at some sweet kitchen shop or something. I mean, it's just, <laughs> right? I mean, they're... they're yeah, they have, they have three. Yeah, they have about three-inch claws on a grizzly bear, about, you know, three times the length of a black bear claw. Yeah, just incredible. Okay, so yeah. so you you are absolutely torn up. You've got you've got wounds on your head, on your ear, on your on your shoulder, and in your hand, in your arm, everywhere. And, and, um, and so now you're doing the sensible thing, which is I got to get help. I got to get down the mountain. So how many miles did you have to go to get back to your car? Well, I had about a three mile hike out of there. So it was about 45 minutes or an hour hike. And it, at the same time, I'm coming down in bear country still. So the farther I got away from her, I felt comfortable. I wasn't going to get attacked by her again. But at the same time, I've got another hour in bear country to still go through. And I'm pretty helpless at this point with a broken arm and tendons hanging out of my arm. So, uh, probably 45 minute hike out of there to get to the trailhead to where my truck was. And by the time I got there, you know, I'd stopped a couple times on the way down and checked my wounds just to see if I needed any bandaging or tourniquet or anything. But most of the wounds were puncture wounds and no like artery severed or anything. So I felt I could make it back to the truck, no problem. And then do first aid there if I needed to. And so I got to the truck and there was a, one other vehicle there and this is on a Saturday morning of bow season. So I'm thinking there's probably other people going to come up here, you know, that weekend to go hunting. And I'm just kind of concerned about someone else walking into this aggressive grizzly bear with cubs. This podcast is brought to you by Laird Superfoods. Let me tell you, these creamers are so amazing. They're super tasty, super delicious. And what they are is whole natural food ingredients mixed into these creamers. And I, I, I'm telling you, when you put this, this stuff into your drink, these powder substance, it is amazing. And their whole tagline is all about fueling your journey. You cannot go and actually power your way up a mountain, uh, be in the pool, ride a big wave, uh, unless you're properly fueled. And these guys are doing it all the right way. So where can you find this? At LairdSuperfood.com. And here's the kicker. If you use the, the, the code name Mark. P20, that's Mark P20, you're going to get 20% off on your first order. So check it out, LairdSuperfood.com. You know, that weekend to go hunting, and I'm just kind of concerned about someone else walking into this aggressive grizzly bear with cubs. So I thought I should probably leave a note on the bulletin board and just warn people. And I was trying to get my truck 
and get like a sticky note out and write a write a note to leave on the board. But I've got a broken arm and the other arm's got 25 puncture wounds and I start to cramp up pretty bad with all the muscle bruising and damage. And I just couldn't get into the couldn't get a sticky note out. I couldn't get anything written. I couldn't get my hand to work. I was dripping blood everywhere. So I had to give up on that idea. And, just decided I'd take a couple quick photos and a little selfie video to share with my buddies and then head on into the hospital. Yeah. So, okay. So it, it was back at the car where you shot this video where, which is where I discovered you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So now you're, how far do you have to go between that parking lot and to a, some kind of medical facility, whether it was a hospital or a clinic or something? That was about a 30 or 40 minute drive from there to the Ennis Hospital. And I had kind of a four-wheel drive, you know, dirt mountain road to drive down for about 10 minutes and then through some farmland and ranch land. And then I didn't have any cell service still at this point. So as I got down the mountain, there was a rancher that was getting out of his mailbox. And I kind of flagged him down. He came over to the truck and saw my bloody face. And I told him I just was attacked by a grizzly bear and asked him if he could call the hospital and just give them warning that I was going to be there in about a half hour so I didn't just walk in all bloody confusing everybody. And he asked if I needed a ride to the hospital and I told him that I'm already bleeding all over my own truck. I don't want to mess yours up too and I'm not going to go into shock. At this point, it had been about an hour later and I, my body had calmed down and I knew what I had to do. And so he went to call the hospital and I headed on into town and it was another 30 minutes from there probably to get to the Ennis Hospital. So once you got to the hospital, were they there waiting for you, um, you know, knowing that, that this, this bear attack uh, survivor it was coming in? And, and, and then the other question, part of that too, is, is how long were you in the hospital for? Yeah, they had got the phone call and they knew I was en route. So as I pulled into the emergency entrance there at the hospital, there was a doctor and a nurse and a sheriff's officer standing outside waiting for me. And so I pulled up there and now I've been probably almost two hours since my attack. So my arms are really cramped up. I can't hardly move my arms just from all the damage. And I couldn't get my truck into park. So I kind of motioned to the sheriff's officer and he came over and uh, got in the truck, put it in park for me, and I couldn't get my seatbelt off as well. So he had to reach over and undo my seatbelt. And I remember him asking, he's like, I'm surprised you took the time to put your seatbelt on. And I'm like, well, I just survived a, a bear attack. I don't want to die in a car wreck on my way to the hospital. So he kind of chuckled at that. But uh, so I got out of the car and into the hospital, and everybody that worked in the hospital had heard about it by then. So they're all lined up kind of in the hallway as I walked in so they could see what I looked like. So I was kind of on parade there for a little bit. And they did x-rays and then about seven hours of stitches. Had a doctor on each side put stitches in my arms and in my head. And it took all the rest of the day just to get me all stitched up. And I don't remember how many stitches, but it was like 29 centimeters of stitches or something they put in me, something like that. And uh, then they sent me back to Bozeman that night. And I'd have to go to the orthopedic surgeon the next day and get a look at my arm where the I had two tendons that were sticking out in my arm and a broken arm. And so they wanted to take a look at that and try to see what would what they had to do to reattach those tendons. So that was the next day. Well, the video that I saw, you know, the first thing before you can see the video now, there's some caption that comes on there and says, hey, this is going to be a very <laughs> gruesome video. Very graphic. Yeah, yeah <laughs> graphic. You want to see it? And I was like, absolutely. Click, right? So then I bounce <laughs> into it. And then, I, you know, you, you go down and you, you show your – your arms and your ear and your face, and you literally look like you just went ten rounds with Mike Tyson. I mean, it's it's a <laughs> it's a unbelievable tale of of how you you went through this. So so look, I, I have uh, had the the honor of uh, speaking with a number of people. One guy was attacked by a shark, and another guy this last week on the pod, uh, he fell overboard in the Indian Ocean and survived for twenty eight hours and. He was attacked by a shark and, and seagulls were trying to dive bomb and pluck out his eyeballs and stung by a stingray. You know, he's, I, I've had all these things and, and in mm -hmm. each one of these, these cases, uh, I've asked this question or it's come out like, how did this change your life? So I've kind of got the same question for you. I mean, from a, from appreciation, you literally had your life flash right past you. Um, yes. You know, how has that transformed your life in terms of the way you see the world now? Well, I think it just reminds you that 
you know, even though the odds are, some, are really slim at something happening, it can it can still happen to you. And, you know, you need to be prepared. You need to think about things that could happen, whatever you're doing in your situation, and be ready for it and know what to do, like, you know, first aid or emergency type, you know, you might have to do to take care of yourself and that will to survive. And it just, it kind of opens your eyes to, you know, you never know when your day's coming. You need to get out there and enjoy it, enjoy the most out of it and take more time off. I mean, I'm a kind of a workaholic. I have my own, uh, you know, custom knife business plus working trails at the Forest Service. So I'm, I'm working way too much and I need to get out and enjoy more hiking and camping and fishing and traveling. And I think that's the big thing. It's just, you know, you never know when your day's coming. So enjoy it to the fullest for sure. Well, one thing that's really cool that you said, you know, really in the opening of this of this uh, this pod was was really following your passion to be in the outdoors, not stuck behind a desk, and so that's what really led you towards the, this work of of um, uh, of being in the woods uh, through the Gulf yes. National Forest, and all those things, and, and you continue to get out there and, and help engineer design uh, different trail systems in the state of great state of Montana. Um, when you're out there, are you looking over your shoulder? What What are you going through? It, it's definitely changed just my how I view everything out there. I'm, I think every day it gets a little bit easier, but I'm still nervous. I'm anxious. My head's on a swivel. I'm. It's not as quite as fun as it used to be because I'm a little nervous still. And you know, I tried to get back out there. I was out there about two months after my attack and went back into the woods hunting. And the next spring I was out in the woods for work. And so I, I knew I had to get back out there right away and just get, get my feet wet again and get back into bear country and, and realize that the odds are it won't happen, but I'm, I'm more prepared. I'm paying more attention out there and hopefully I can avoid that situation again and just enjoy the Montana outdoors that we have to, that, that offers here for us. Well, it, it really is an unbelievable state. And, and when I first, uh, I built a couple of log cabins out there. And when I first got out there, it was the ultimate in, you know, being a city slicker. I was from, originally from the uh, state of Washington, city of Seattle. And, and I hadn't been out in the wilderness like that before. And, and right. I had to deal and take on rattlesnakes and bears and uh, coyotes and all those things. And, you know, I, I was very, um, I'm not sure if the word is nervous, but I was just very uncomfortable being in that setting. And over the years, I was probably out there in 12 years in, in total. And the more and more I got around, the more comfortable I got. And I just got kind of a, a fearless uh, place where 99% of the time, like you're talking about, uh, the, the whatever uh, animal, reptile, whatever that you, that you see out there is always running to get away because there's such an abundance of food supply. And really, the only time that they're turning yeah. on you is when they feel threatened in in some way. We actually had a a, um, a guest that came out many years ago to our place, and uh, and she was uh, mm-hmm. severely bitten by a rattlesnake, and you know, essentially, she just stepped on it, right? And that's mm-hmm. what it was her own real, really, it was her stupidity that that created that. But um, of not being aware of her her surroundings, and, and in your case. Um, you know, you don't want to come in between those those uh, those cubs and mama bear and and yeah, know, that's one of the worst them. situations we're doing that. Sound cubs for sure. Yeah, yeah. So so let me ask you about this. So that the whole the whole tale is unbelievable, and I can't believe that that happened to to, to anyone, let alone you. And I'm very blessed, obviously, <laughs> that we're actually having this conversation because I'm well, thank you. survived and, and you got through it. You also have a entrepreneurial bug, and you started this this knife company called Sky Blade. Um, did any of that have to do with survival? So, really, I guess the question is, what is Sky Blade knives, and is it is it a survival knife or is it a hunting knife, or what what is the intent for this? Well, I, yeah, I started Sky Blade knives about thirty years ago now, and it was more of you know, I'm in the outdoors every day, so you always carry a knife. That's one thing my dad always told you. You have a knife. You never know what you might need it for. And then being a hunter and a fisherman, it's like you need a knife as well. And just had a friend of the family that was a knife maker, an older guy, and he was over for dinner one time, and we started chatting, and I thought that'd be really cool to, to build my own knife. And so that was where it all started. And then while I was in college, it was kind of like, well, I had to talk to some friends that might want a gift for their dad for Father's Day or something. And so I'm like, yeah, I can build you this really cool custom knife. And it just kind of grew from there into a business. And I try to do designs that are all, you know, built to use, um, whether it's hunting or fishing or just everyday carry for survival. 
It's a knife designs that feel good in your hand and they're built to, to be used and, you know, have a lifetime warranty. He's the best stainless steel available. So it's something that uh, someone could, no matter where you're at, even in the kitchen, you know, you need, you need a knife. So, well, let's go back to the thing you said a few minutes ago, which is really the, the lesson for anybody is that when you go out into the outdoors and I'm out in the outdoors, I live in Sun Valley, so I'm out there every day is you really need to bring all the things that you don't think you're going to bring in many cases. And certainly sure. having those survival tools, whether it's a, a first aid ointments um, and, you know, if it's a knife, if you're going into bear country, spray, whatever it is, you just need to be prepared. And so, I mean, it's great that you've turned this passion, not necessarily because you got attacked, but, but um, for just, you know, the realistic um, elements of the things that you need being in the outdoors. Yes, that is correct. There's always something you need out there, and it's good to have all of that. You know, get the get the correct information and know what you need in any situation. You never know when the weather's going to change, or if you fall and get injured, and now you've got you know three days on your own to try to crawl out of the mountains. You're going to need some items, and so it's a good thing to have for sure. Yeah, and so where can people find these Skyblade knives? I've got a website, SkybladeKnives.com. And you can also um, view them on Facebook as well and get in touch with me on Instagram as well so also. Okay, cool. And one of the things I, I want to do is for sure put this YouTube link, if, uh, if that's okay, on the in the show notes. I mean, it's just something that everybody has got to see already. 1.5 million people have seen it, including me several times. So, it's, I mean, it's <laughs> well, just there, intense. There's been a, yeah, there's been a lot more. My original video when I posted on Facebook, it had 39 million views in 48 hours. And so that's how I went viral around the world. And now there's, you know, it's on YouTube and it's all, it's all over out there now. But the original Facebook one had 39 million views in 48 hours. Pretty crazy. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, listen, I, I so appreciate you coming on the pod. Uh, you're a brave soul. You're, you're, you're out there. And, you know, the great thing is you really understood your circumstance at the time. You don't harbor any ill will against bears, of course. And you sure. continue to yep. have a, a love of the outdoors. So I uh, just really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And I just like to remind people out there to you know make sure you've got your bear spray. It, it didn't work immediately in my situation, but 99% of the time it will work. And it definitely, after a few seconds, she was gone. So that helped. And just you know, take your earbuds or headphones off and uh, pay attention around you and be prepared. You never know when it's coming. Right on. All right, Todd. I appreciate it. And have a great day. Thanks, Mark. You as well. All right. Thank buddy. you. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So, until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye. Bye.